السلام عليك زين الأنبياء السلام عليك بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم تسليم على سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أجمعين سبحانك لا إلمنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله This is an immense blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be here together those of you that are in person and those of you that are following online now live and those that will listen sometime later inshallah every single one of us will get our portion of the blessings and the mercy of coming together for his sake subhanahu wa ta'ala and were that be the only thing that we did was just to come together for his sake it would be sufficient and if we add to that a study of one of the greatest works ever penned in islamic history and that we add to that as well dhikr and remembering allah subhanahu wa ta'ala together and prayer together and companionship and so forth and so on the blessings will be that abundant inshallah and it will be light upon light bi ta'ala as Shu'aib mentioned, um, that I think I get more excited about these retreats than all of you, if any of you actually are excited. Um, there is nothing really more that I would rather do than spend time in the books of Hujjat al Islam, Imam al Ghazali, but in particular, the Ahayl al which is his masterpiece, his magnum opus. And <clears throat> as one of them has said, were the deceased to be resurrected, they would have only advised the alive with what is with what that which is in the Ihyalu Middin. In other words, that this is like a uh, that, if you will, manifesto, wherein that we can learn the essence of what beneficial knowledge really is. And the Imam Ghazali's Ihya is comprehensive, it's encyclopedic, but at the same time. When you read it, it's like an elixir from the sincerity of the author. Every word that you read, every sentence that you read, every page that you read, you quite literally find your heart come to life. And this is the whole purpose. And when we at times go into a little bit of theory, we have to remind ourselves to bring it back. Because, and this was studying this at an academic level for a period of time, I was conflicted because I was like, wait. Isn't that doing exactly what Imam al-Ghazali is saying not to do? And isn't that in contradiction in some ways with his that unique conception of Imtariq al-Akhira? And to a certain degree it is, in if it simply becomes mental gymnastics. But if the purpose there is to learn it so that you could put it into practice, so that you can live it, so that it can become alive within you, then of course that it's not. And what a blessed night to have this retreat on. This is the first night of Rajab. And Rajab al-Fard, the solitary month of the four Arbat Ashwar al-Hurum, the four inviolable months, this is the one that comes alone. And this is the month that our Prophet used to make dua, and we like to begin with that, Allahumma barakna fi Rajab al-Sha'ban wa ballighna Ramadan. Allah place blessing for us in Rajab, in Sha'ban, and cause us to reach Ramadan. And so what a blessed night. And this is a night, it's one of the four nights of the year that we know that Sayyidina Ali bin Abi Talib, who, who knew the Sunnah better than Sayyidina Ali bin Abi Talib, he would, what's called, Ihya layla bil ibadah, Ihya al-layl, bringing the night to life in worship. The first night of Rajab, the night of the 15th of Sha'ban, and the two nights that precede the day of Eid, he would spend these nights in worship. And the bare minimum that you and all, we all have to do is to pray Isha in congregation and Fajr in congregation. And if we do that, we'll get our nasib, our portion of the night. But a higher rank is to spend a significant portion of the night in worship, making dua, supplicating Allah, remembering Allah, salawat upon the Prophet وسلم, reading the Quran, prayer, all of the different ways that we worship. And the very best thing to do is those is what those who before us did. Um, the righteous among them was to spend the entire night in worship. 
And there were people that were like this. So I did want to just, for the blessing, there is a uh, supplication that is, that is mentioned and attributed to Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jilani, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, in his book, al Ghunya. And um, he says that this is from the blessed supplications that should be made on this night, the first night of Rajab. So we will recite this together, inshallah ta'ala. Ilahi, ta'arrada laka fi hadhi al-layla al-muta'arridun wa qasadaka al-qasidun wa ammala fadlaka wa ma'rufaka al-talibun wa laka fi hadhi al-layla nafahatun wa jawaiz wa ataya wa mawahib تمن بها على من تشاء من إبادك وتمنعها ممن لم تسبق له العناية منك وها أنا ذا عبدك الفقير إليك المؤمل فضلك ومعروفك فإن كنت يا مولاي تفضلت في هذه الليلة على أحد من خلقك وجدت عليه بعائدة من عطفك فصلي على سيدنا محمد وآله وصحبه وجود علي بطولك ومعروفك يا رب العالمين ما شاء الله تبارك الله إن شاء الله بس this is a great portion of this night إن شاء الله تعالى and that we will receive immense blessings from the bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we are starting now the book on knowledge, book one of the Ihya al -Umidin. So it's only fitting that we remind ourselves of aspects of the biography of this great Imam, Hujjat al-Islam, the proof of Islam, the only scholar really in Islamic history that was given this blessed name. And there's multiple reasons that this is the case. And when we initially started, we actually started as our teachers did in Tareem from the Rub'a al-Muhlikat. So when we said that we did a khatam and we finished reading the book, we actually started from book 21. And then we went all the way until the end as our teachers uh, did in, in Tareem. And then now we're starting from the beginning. Inshallah, we ask Allah wa ta'ala to give us a long life so that we'll eventually be able to go through all 40. So if that we're able to do it, and we're still alive, and we have good health, and none of the retreats are canceled, you can do the math. So if we do five a year, then it's going to take us eight years to finish. But inshallah ta'ala, wa ma thalika ala Allahi aziz. This is possible from the bounty of Allah ta'ala. And even if we do that, we're only then approximating what the great imams did before us in relation to this book. The tradition that the Abdul Fagir was blessed to be exposed to this book and study it through them is that they placed immense focus on it. And the brother of Imam Abdullah bin Abi Bakr Aydirus al-Akbar read the Ihya al 25 times with his older brother, Imam al -Aydurus. And then he taught it 25 times. His son, Imam Abdurrahman bin Ali, read it 40 times with his father and then he taught it 40 times. They mentioned the same thing about the son of Imam al-Haddad, Imam Hassan bin Abdullah Haddad. Read it 25 times, i.e. studied it, and then taught it 25 times. And they even mentioned that there was a blessed Sayyid from the Shatari family that memorized the entire Ihya al And so, and that he'd be able to differentiate between a wow and a fat, which is very difficult, even for hafal, right? Is it a wow or is it a fat? You forget. But he was able to differentiate between a wow and a fat, uh, and if someone would make a mistake to that degree of, of itqan, of hifth. Anyhow, let's, let's remind ourselves of Imam Ghazali a little bit. And um, he was born in a city, Tus, and actually in Tabaran, that is in the environs of, of Tus. And he was born to a very blessed father who loved the scholars, and he loved knowledge, although he himself was not a scholar. And they mention in his biography that when his father used to go to the gatherings of the scholars, he used to wish that Allah Ta'ala would bless him with a scholar as a son. 
when he would go to the gathering of those who were delivering reminders, public speeches, orators. He wished that Allah Ta'ala would give him a son that could give admonitions and benefit people. And Allah Ta'ala honored that blessed intention in his heart and gave him Imam al-Ghazali, Muhammad bin Muhammad al-Ghazali, and his brother as well, Imam Ahmad bin Muhammad, who was also a, not only a great scholar, but someone who is that very important in the Persian literary tradition, especially in relation to the love of Allah and that writing about the love of Allah in Persian. And so he was that an established mystic even before Imam al-Ghazali set out on the path the way that he did. And when Imam al-Ghazali's father uh, was close to passing, he put them under the care of what is referred to as his friend who was a Sufi friend. And this is a word we're gonna, not even going to go into details and qualify this anymore. We should get beyond that immaturity of having even qualified every time that we say that. That's a word of praise. This means that means he's someone devoted to the spiritual path, devoted to the remembrance of Allah, that is scrupulous in his implementation of the sharia. That's what we mean by a Sufi. This is a word of praise. And he left him in his care. And once the small inheritance that was left dried up, they had nowhere to go. And he was someone that couldn't care for them further. So the only place for them to go was the madrasa, was the school. And this is why Imam Ghazali said at a later point, is that at first we sought knowledge for other than the sake of Allah. But knowledge refused to be sought except for the sake of Allah. In other words, is that Knowledge of the sacred law purifies you. It purifies your intention. And this is very different than someone who just, that absolutely has no other intention except that worldly intentions. You know, who knows what's going to happen to that person. But if someone is, has a good intention and because of circumstance ends up in a school or something like that, when you experience the beauty of sacred learning, it transforms you in a very powerful way. And I remember that as a young man just becoming Muslim, being exposed to this incredible tradition. And it was one book in translation. Now we are blessed to have Sheikh Hamza as the translator and the teacher and a scholar from Mauritania teaching the book of Sayyid Abdul Wahid ibn Asher. But that book changed my life. And when I just read a few pages of this book, I was like, how on earth could I stay in the United States of America, let alone in the university? When this knowledge exists, how could I, how, how on earth? I could, it was beyond my control. Because there's something special about the sacred law. It is coated with light and it brings your heart to life. And it is knowledge that we are in the, uh, we are in absolute need of in this world and the next. So he goes to the madrasa and he begins learning with a local scholar. In, in the local school. And he was also exposed in an early time to scholars of the spiritual path. And they mentioned a scholar by the name of Sheikh Ahmed Aradha Kani. And Imam Ghazali has a quote that he mentions later on describing his youth. And he was someone that was very intelligent and very inquisitive. And oftentimes the most intelligent people are the most inquisitive. They're the people that when they hear about something and they're not content with what people say about it. They research. They look into it. They want to get to the depths of something. They want to understand same things. I remember seeing these videos. They're called How Things Are Made. It's really cool. You get beyond just understanding the outward dimension. You want to know how that's made. What are the components of it? That type of thinker uh, is the type of thinker that if, you, if he studies for a period of time, will achieve great things. Imam al was like this. He says, The thirst for grasping the real meanings of things was indeed my habit and want from my early year and in the prime of my life. It was an instinctive, natural disposition placed in my makeup by Allah Most High, not something due to my own choosing and contriving. This is how we should be in relation to knowledge. You hear about an idea, you learn it, you hear about a book, that you purchase it, that you talk to people, and you, the precious time that we have, you, we spend it learning constantly. And then at a certain point, after that learning from local scholars and Mamal Ghazali 
that he eventually goes to the Nizamiya, where he studied with the great Imam al Juwaini. And of course, I'm abridging this uh, because he started local and then he went to that a, another place. Um, and then there's the famous story when he came back and the brigands that took what was called his ta'liqa, his marginal notes. Anyhow, that he, um, that it was, that somewhere around this time, that he went through a period of skepticism. He was trying to that think deeply about how to come to truth. And he kept trapping himself in the way that he was thinking. And so he went through a brief period of skepticism. Outwardly he was practicing, but inwardly he was somewhat confused. But the beautiful thing here is, is that Allah cured him of that. And if you look at his own personal anecdote of how that happened, this is key, and we don't have time to go into this, and I was telling us, I said, I want to stay on target because we have a lot of material to cover. But you could talk about this for a long period of time because it's so significant. His quote says, At length Allah Most High cured me of that sickness. My soul regained its health and equilibrium, and, uh, equilibrium, and once again I accepted the self-evident data of reason and relied on them with safety and certainty. But that was not achieved by constructing a proof or putting together an argument. On the contrary, it was the effect of a light which Allah Most High cast into my heart. And that light is the key to most knowledge. And that light is the key to most knowledge. So, in other words, he pointed to a meta-rational source of knowledge. And anyone who knows a little bit about the Western tradition, in particular, uh, that someone like Descartes and everything that happened to him, it's a very different thing. And then thus that we see the mire that Western philosophy is in until this day. That they're trapped in the subject-object dichotomy. And they can't get out. However, that this is very, very significant. For Imam Ghazali, that he attributes it not to higher rational proofs or anything that relates to the aql, light that comes to his heart. And this is, of course, very, very significant. So he goes to the Nilamiya, he studies with Imam al-Juwaini, and he becomes a very renowned student and then eventually that renowned scholar, where at one point he teaches in the Nilamiya. And then he goes through a second personal crisis. The first relates to that knowledge, epistemology. It relates to that his understanding the true nature of things and how reason relates to the senses and so forth and so on. But the second one was a spiritual crisis. He started to question his intentions. Why was he doing this? Why was he doing what it is that he was doing? And at this, at, in this situation, something similar happened. He would go back and forth wanting to leave, but then at the same time that he would decide to stay in his position that he was holding at the Nidhamiya. And then he himself also that, uh, that describes what had then happened. And that he, he says is that it reached a point where I could not utter a single word. And so in his own words he says, One day I would firmly resolve to leave Baghdad and disengage myself from those circumstances, and another day I would revoke my resolution. Thus I incessantly vacillated between the con contending pull of worldly desires and the peals of the afterlife for about six months. And he dates it, starting with Rajab of the year 488. In this month the matter passed from choice to compulsion. For Allah put a lock upon my tongue. So I was impeded from public teaching. I struggled with myself to teach for a single day to gratify the hearts of the students who were frequenting my lectures. But my tongue would not utter a single word. La ilaha illallah. You can just imagine that. Someone is famous, Imam Ghazali, that his gift was one of teaching, was one of that speaking, was one of debate, and then all of a sudden not being able to speak. And then he goes on to say 
that when I perceive my powerlessness and when my capacity to make a choice had completely collapsed, I sought refuge in Allah, as does a hard-pressed man who has no way out of his difficulty. And I was answered by him who answers the needy man when he calls on him. Broken before Allah. أَمَّنْ يُجِيبُ الْمُضْطَرِ إِذَا دَعَاهُ الْإِضْطِرَارِ Being in a state where you are aware of your absolute need of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's a beautiful place to be. That's where you and I want to be. Because if we can get there, the faraj, the relief, will come very quickly. That's where we want to be. Broken before Allah. Feeling like we are in need of Allah. And if Allah loves you, eventually you will be in that state. And outwardly you might be a wreck, but then you'll realize the wisdom. La ilaha illallah. That's what it was for. And then once we can get there, results oftentimes happen very quickly. And then the awliya and the salihin remain there. And that's how they heart, want their hearts to be. They want their hearts to prostrate. They love prostration outwardly. But they want to reach a point where their hearts prostrate. They're constantly in a state of humility and lowliness and brokenness before Allah in feeling of absolute need. And if we can remain there, then there's just constant taraqi. Right? Because water goes to the depressions in the earth. It goes to the low places. Look at where these little creeks are and where we live here in Pennsylvania. They go to the low points. And if you can always remain there, that you will just be gathering mercy constantly. So Imam al-Ghazali also speaks about his time, his period of seclusion. And he says that I entered Damascus and resided there nearly for nearly two years. And they know where Imam al-Ghazali was. Uh, and that and it can be visited. My only occupation was seclusion and solitude and spiritual exercise and combat with a view to devoting myself to the purification of my soul and the cultivation of virtues and cleansing my heart for the remembrance of Allah Most High and the way I had learned from the writings of the Sufis. In the course of those periods of solitude, things impossible to enumerate or detail in depth were unveiled to me. This much that I shall mention. That may be that benefit may be derived from it. I knew with certainty that the Sufis are those who uniquely follow the way to Allah Most High. Their mode of life is the best of all, their way the most direct of ways, and their ethic the purest. Indeed, were one to combine the insight of the intellectuals, the wisdom of the wise, the lore of the scholars, versed in the mysteries of revelation, in order to change a single item of Sufi conduct and ethic and replace it with something better. No way to do so would be found. And when he means the Sufis here, he means those realized in Ihsan, Ma'rifah, those who know Allah. That's what he means. For all their motions in silences, exterior and interior. We're not talking about goofy Sufis here. Unfortunately, you know, we're talking about real people that take the spiritual path seriously. The real men and women of the path are learned from the light in the niche of prophecy. And beyond the light of prophecy, there is no light on earth from which illumination can be obtained. And this is one of the main reasons why he's hujjah to Islam. Because his life is a proof. Is that he traveled a path where he reached the pinnacle of what you can reach by way of your intellect. The intellect gets you to the door. The intellect is important. But... It doesn't get you in. We know Allah with our hearts. Knowledge of Allah, its locus is your heart. And the internal dimension of the human being, your ruh, your nafs, your aql, your qalb, all of them are important. It's who you are, really, as a human being. All of them have their function. But the heart is the mahal al-ma'rifah. It is the locus of the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we have to that preserve our hearts and to recognize that we need to care for them and to direct them properly. When you live a life like he lived, and a lot more scholarship is being done in Imam Ghazali, that people 
thought for a while, and these are Western scholars, that because of his period of seclusion that he wasn't active outward. And no Muslim would ever say that because we believe he's a mujaddid. A mujaddid is not a walifa, a duty, where you're going to be passive. Right? That is just, you know, the mistaken assumptions of Western scholarship at first that you had different uh, um, groups of Christians that were trying to claim Imam al-Ghazali. Because that they reminded they they were reminded of their own faith by certain aspects of that how uh, that he was approaching things, but they in some ways skewed the Western uh, the Western perspective on Imam Ghazali, and then you have what's called now this quote unquote revisionist scholarship that's going in a whole other direction trying to that point out other aspects of Imam Ghazali's scholarship, all of them are falling short with what the way that we should have that seen Imam Ghazali from the beginning. And all of his different contributions that he made. Um, anyhow, that when you live the way that he lived, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses you to die in a very good way. And that uh, there's a, a, a quote of his brother who was present when he passed away. And he said the following about the passing of Imam Ghazali. On Monday at the time of the dawn prayer, my brother Abu Hamid performed his ablutions and then said, Hand me my shroud, right, which you're going to be buried in. He then took it, kissed it, placed it on his two eyes, and then said, I hear and obey the command to enter into the presence of the king. He then spread out his legs, faced the direction of prayer, and died shortly before sunrise. La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. And one of my favorite stories of all, that you can't mention enough, is and there's differences of, of who actually saw the dream but uh, one of the great imams saw a dream and in the dream was the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and the Prophet Isa and the Prophet Moses Sallallahu and that in the dream that Moses asked السلام, Imam Ghazali what is your name? he said my name is Muhammad ibn Muhammad ibn Muhammad ibn Ahmad al-Ghazali and when he said that, he said, I asked you your name. Why did you mention so many people? Why did you start giving me your lineage? And then Imam Uzzai looked at the Prophet and said, Should I respond or should I remain silent? And the Prophet said, Ajib, respond. So he said, Moses, when Allah asked you what was in your right hand, What did you say? He said, Right? It is my staff that I use it to tend to my sheep uh, and uh, I, I, I lean on it uh, and I use it to tend to my sheep and I have other purposes for it as well. And then that Moses realized, and the Prophet looked at them and said, Do you have a habar, a great scholar, the likes of him, and any of your two ummas? And so Imam Ghazali is one of the great scholars the greatest scholars of this ummah. There's no doubt about that. And alhamdulillah that his works are still with us. And there's no doubt in the post nidhamiyah phase of his life, he was dedicated to reviving the deen. And this is what we're going to read now when we look at his Ihya al which is his greatest work, hands down. Even though that he wrote that many other works before in his earlier period and that after. And all of his works post-Nidhamiya should be considered as a part of what you could call his project of tajdeed, of renewal. And we'll touch a little bit on upon this tomorrow when we talk about this because the thrust of the Ihya, which is what is called Ilm Tariq Al-Akhirah, it's a bit of a mouthful to say, but the science of the path to the hereafter. It's very important. Ilm tariq al akhirah Just memorize the Arabic because when you sell, talk to people about the science of the path to the hereafter, it's a little bit long. But that's the way you would translate it. And it's called science because it's systematic. It's not just knowledge. It's systematically arranged, which is why science is a better word to use to translate here than knowledge. The science of the path to the hereafter. Three words. Ilm tariq al akhirah and that's tomorrow morning session that we'll begin the day with, inshallah ta'ala. And it's the thrust of the Ihya. And it's the thrust of most of his books 
that serve as like abridgments of the Ihya or or part of his project of Tajdeed. Okay. And it's of the utmost importance that we understand it. So now we're going to pause Bidni Ta'ala and we are going to look at his introduction and that uh, analyze it slightly Bidni Ta'ala and to highlight some of the important things. But at first we're just going to read it and um, up until a certain point. Inshallah Ta'ala. So this is the way that he begins his whole Ihya. He says, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. أحمد الله أولا حمد كثير متواليا وإن كان يتضاء لدون حق جلال حمد الحامدين. First, I praise Allah abundantly and unceasingly, even though the praise of those who praise is less than what is due to His Majesty. وصلي وسلم على رسوله ثانيا صلاة تستغرق مع سيد البشر سائر المرسلين. Second, I ask blessings and peace for His Messenger. Blessings that encompass along with the leader of mankind and the rest of the messengers. وَاسْتَخِيرُهُ تَعَالَ ثَالِثًا فِي مَنْ بَعَثَ عَزْمِ مِنْ تَحْرِيرِ كِتَابًا فِي إِحْيَأْلُ مِدِّينَ Third, I seek guidance from Him Most High regarding what I have resolved to undertake, namely, the composition of a book that revives the religious sciences. وَأَنْ تَدِبُوا لِقَطْعِ تَعَجُّبِكَ رَابِعًا Fourth, I dedicate myself to ending your self-righteousness. أيها العاذل الغالي في العذل بين زمرة الجاهدين O critics among the deniers of truth who exceed all bounds of criticism المصرف في التقريع والإنكار من بين تبقات المنكرين الغافلين O transgressor among the ranks of heedless rejectors who goes too far in reproach and rejection فقال حل لساني عقدة الصمت وتوقني أهدة الكلام وقلادة النقط ما أنت مثابن علي من العماء جليه الحق your persistence in blindness to evident truth, Jaliyat al-Haq, has untied the knot of silence from my tongue and imposed upon me the obligation to speak in the responsibility to articulate the truth. This was also caused by your relentless support of falsehood, adornment of ignorance. An incitement against anyone who prefers to depart somewhat from the established practice of men. And turn slightly away from the adherence to formalism, from adherence to formalism towards acting upon the dictates of knowledge. Desiring thereby to attain. What Allah Most High has commanded pertaining to purification of the soul and rectification of the heart. Making amends for some of what preceded of the tendency to waste life, although despairing from full redress and remedy. In keeping away from those about whom the lawgiver has said the most severely punished on the day of judgment will be the scholar whom Allah did not benefit from his knowledge. By my life, there is no reason for your persistent rejection except the disease that has become an epidemic upon the multitudes, among the multitudes, rather encompassing the majority, the disease of falling short in regarding the culmination of this affair. Wal Wal Jiddun in ignorance of the gravity of the affair and seriousness of the crisis. Wal Wa the next life is approaching. The present world is vanishing. Death is imminent. The journey is far. Provisions for the journey are scant. The dangers are great and the road is blocked. The perceptive know that only knowledge and works done sincerely for Allah will benefit. With neither guide nor companion, the journey on the road to the next life, with its many pitfalls, is difficult and tiring. The guides to the way are the learned, 
were the heirs of the prophets. وَقَدْ شَغَرَ عَنْهُمَ الزَّمَانِ وَلَمْ يَبْقَى إِلَّا الْمُتْرَسِّمُونَ But our age is void of them, and only the superficial remain. وَقَدْ اسْتَحْوَذَ عَلَىٰ أَكْثَرِهِمَ الشَّيْطَانِ وَاسْتَغْوَاهُمَ الطُّغْيَانِ And Satan has mastery over most of them. وَأَصْبَحَ كُلُّ وَاحِدِ مِعَاجِلِ حَظِي مَشْغُوفًا فَصَارِ يَرَى الْمَعْرُوفَ مُنْكَرًا وَالْمُنْكَرَ مَعْرُوفًا All of them were so engrossed in their worldly fortunes that they came to see good as evil and evil as good. حَتَّى ظَلَّ عَلَمُ الدِّينِ مُنْدَرِسًا وَمَنَارُ الْهُدَى فِي أَقْطَارُ الْعَرْضِ مُنْطَمِسًا So that the landmarks of religion disappeared and the light of guidance was extinguished all over the world. وَلَقَدْ خَيَّلُوا إِلَى الْخَلْقِ أَلَّا عِلْمَ إِلَّا فَتْوَى حُكُومَةً تَسْتِعِينُ بِهِ الْقُضَاةُ عَلَى فَصِّ الْخُصَامِ عَنْدَ تَهَاوِشِ الْتُغَامِ They made people imagine that there is no knowledge except the formal legal rulings of a government by which judges settle disputes when foolish people quarrel. O جَدَلٍ يَتَدَرَّعُ بِهِ الطَّالِبُ الْمُبَاهَاتِ الْوَإِلَى الْغَلَبَةِ وَالْإِفْحَامِ Or the ability to debate, which is displayed by the vainglorious in order to confuse and refute. O سَجَعُونَ مُزَخْرَفُونَ يَتَوَصُّرُ بِهِ الْوَاعِدُ إِلَى الْاسْتِدْرَاجِ الْعَوَامِ إِذْ لَمْ يَرَوْ مَا سِوَ هَذِي ثَلَاثَةِ مُصِيدَةً لِلْحَرَامِ وَشَبَكَةً لِلْحُطَامِ Or their elaborate and flowery language by which the preacher seeks to lure the common people. Apart from these three types of knowledge, they could find no other ways to profit or in acquire the riches of the world. فَأَمَّا عِلْمُ طَرِيكَ الْآخِرَةِ وَمَا دَرَجَ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَفَ الصَّالَةِ مِمَّا سَمَّاهُ لَهُ سُبْحَانُهُ فِي كِتَابِ فِقْهًا وَحِكْمَةً وَعِلْمًا وَضِيَاءً وَنُورًا وَهِدَايَةً وَرُشْدًا فَقَالْ أَصْبَحَ بَيْنَ الْخَلْقِ مَطْوِيًّا وَصَارَ نَسْيًا وَنْسِيًّا As for the science of, of the path to the hereafter and how the righteous predecessors lived, the religion. Which Allah the Exalted called in His book, understanding, wisdom, knowledge, illumination, light, guidance, and rectitude. It has faded from creation and become a thing forgotten. وَنَمَّا كَانَ هَذَا الثَّلْمٍ فِي الدِّينِ مُلِمٍ وَخَطْمًا مُدْلَهِمًا مُدْلَهِمًا رَأَيْتُ الْإِشْتِغَارَ بِتَحْرِيرِ هَذَا الْكِتَابِ مَهْمَا بِتَحْرِيرِ هَذَا الْكِتَابِ إِحْيَاءٍ لِعُلُومِ الدِّينِ This is a calamity in religion. In a grave crisis, so I considered it an important duty for me to compose this book in order to revive the religious sciences. Wa kashfan an manahij al imat al muntaqadimin wa idahan lima hiya lima fihi lima hiya al ulum al nafi and al nabiin wa sarf al sadihin. Salam Allah ani majmiin to reveal ways of the early imams and to clarify the branches of of knowledge, the prophets and predecessors. Regarded as useful, and then he says, "Wakad asas tu har arba ti arba." We can recite in English now. I have divided into four quarters, which are the quarter of worship, the quarter of customs, the quarter of perils, and the quarter of deliverance. I have begun the work work with the book on knowledge, because it is of the utmost importance. I have begun the work with the book of knowledge, because it is of the utmost importance. First, so he's going to mention three reasons why. To clarify the knowledge that Allah has on the tongue of His Messenger وسلم, ordered every individual to seek. For the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said, seeking knowledge is an obligation for every Muslim. I also distinguish, this is number two, beneficial knowledge from harmful knowledge. For He said, وسلم, we seek refuge with Allah from knowledge that does not benefit. In addition, I demonstrate the deviation of the present generation from the right way. How they are deluded by the glimmer of a mirage, and how they are satisfied with the husk of the religious sciences rather than their kernel. Okay, and then at this point, he will uh, go into a, a detailed. Uh, he'll go into more details, uh, and list all of the books in each quarter. So the Ahlul Madin has what are called forty books. They're like volumes, and the first quarter is what he calls the Rubal Ibadat, on worship. And the second is the Rubal Adat, which are like the word that you, you can translate as customs, but it gets into things like eating, marriage, uh, earning a living, and things of that nature. And then the uh, second half begins with the third quarter, which is the quarter on destructive vices, like envy and so forth and so on. And then the last part of the Ihya, the last quarter, are the, is, the, uh, is on the saving virtues. Uh, then he'll um, explain in his introduction 
uh, what he'll, he'll give an overview of, of what it is that he did in uh, each of those quarters. And he will talk about how his book is differentiated from the books that came before him. And he mentions five specific ways that it was differentiated. We're not going to talk about that for time's sake. Um, but he talks about five different ways that his book was differentiated from the books that came before because it definitely is unique. There is no doubt that he benefited greatly from many who came before him. In particular, that uh, Ibn Abi Dunya, uh, that in particular, that Abu Talib al Makki, that uh, Raghab al Asfahani, and others. Imam Wazali benefited greatly from many who came before him. And uh, oftentimes that he uh, quotes uh, heavily from the books of his predecessors. But he, he, he quotes it for a purpose and he will that arrange things in a way that make it more accessible for us. And then of course that he adds points and explains points and so forth and so on. So then when he starts talking about how he's committed in this work, which he does in his introduction to, what is called ilm um, al-mu'amala. We're going to talk about that tomorrow. Uh, inshallah ta'ala when we give the breakdown of ilm tariq al-akhira which is again the science of the path to the hereafter and the two um, sub great subdivisions of it which is ilm al-mu'amala and ilm al-mukashifa the knowledge of praxis and we'll explain that a little bit tomorrow which is about dealings interactions and then the knowledge of unveiling and how he's committed in this book to the knowledge of praxis given us what it is that we need and so that we attain that fruit eventually bi'idhnillahi ta'ala so I wanted to look at this um, as, a, as the, the third bullet point in this, in, this, in this session is look at some of the things that, that, that he has said here and, and to analyze them because it's, it's very important he says when he, Imam Ghazali speaks is that he speaks with purpose and um, he is very careful about everything that it is that he says. There's a reason that he mentions what he mentions, where he mentions it. And the first part of this is, if we look at um, the way that he began his book, and the rhetoric is amazing when you read it in Arabic, and it's very hard to understand, uh, and, and you have to actually look up a lot of words, especially on his debadges, his introductions to the, to the various chapters. Um, but normally, authors that begin run writing books, it was very common for them to praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ta ta in many different ways. And sometimes, introductions go on for a page or two, or a page and a half. And this was very much a part of um, that the way this was their custom and how they began books. And part of it was is that they were people of Allah, that they're praising Allah Ta'ala, you get reward for it. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, and also, too, um, it is permissible for a scholar to show their eloquence to the reader, to let them know you are in the hands of a master who knows exactly what he's doing and that can speak in a certain way so that you know that, okay, he knows the science that I'm going to now read that about what he wrote about this particular science. But Imam al-Zadi here in the Ihya didn't do that. It's extremely brief. And he didn't even use the word amma ba'd, which you find throughout the, uh, the, the works of, of the scholars, where they'll have an introduction and they'll say amma ba'd. And the reason here, he did that intentionally. And they mentioned the wisdom is he wanted to create a sense of urgency. And so if I would have just read the Arabic, it's not that long. By the time that you get to one tadibu li qat'i ta'ajubika rabi'an, fourth, I dedicate myself to ending your self-righteousness. So he praises Allah. Obviously, he begins with Bismillah. He praises Allah. He very briefly sends salawat upon the, the messengers. Right? And then, third, he tells us right away, I seek guidance from him regarding what I have resolved to undertake, namely, the composition of a book that revives the religious sciences. La ilaha illallah. Right, boom, boom, boom. A book that revives the religious sciences. And then fourth, boom, he starts to attack his, uh, that uh, the opponent that he feels is, has led the situation to get as it is. 
and for uh, Imam Ghazali, uh, that this is the scholarly class of his time. Now, the audience of the Ahi is not just a scholarly class. It's his attack is primarily levied at the scholarly class. But, you know, there's only so much time we have. Like, again, you could have a whole weekend session just on this concept. And believe me, it is just as relevant today as it was during his time. And even though that there might be slightly different ways that it's relevant, the principles are the same. When we talk about ilm tariq al-akhirah, it's just as relevant today as it was then. And in fact, there are scholarly methodologies, in particular the one that this Abdul Fakir was exposed to, that have that appropriated and made it a part of their tradition and spread it all over the world. And it's alive as we speak. And when you use it, you can use it as your not only your approach to religious knowledge, but you can use it in every aspect of your life. If you really understand what he's trying to get across with the in tariq al-akhirah, it is applicable to every aspect of your life. To your family life, to your career, to all of the decisions that you make about what it is that you're going to do. It's applicable to everything. And as we go through this, that you'll start to see this, inshallah ta'ala. And the key is, is that you and I learn, most importantly, to live it. And so, that his primary target, no doubt, when he gets into this, when he says fourth, Rabi'an, or is the scholarly class. And that he's starting, he wants to point out their foundational mistakes. And why is he speaking with such urgency? And why is he seems to be so hard on them? Because of the danger. Because of the danger. More people, people usually get led, as, you know, away from the religion by religious people. Mama Ghazali recognized that danger. And it's a very serious thing. And that we, we know that the very first people to be punished on Yom al are people who have knowledge before people that worshipped idols. It's a danger. Right? And the Prophet was more worried about evil scholars even than the Dajjal. Because people are wearing religious garb, talking religious language, but if their hearts aren't in the right place. And think about how, I mean, look at the time in which we live. How many people end up having serious problems in their religion because of religious people. Now, part of that is uh, their own religious immaturity, and they were looking to highly at someone in attributing things to them. They're not angels that they shouldn't have attributed. So it's a very nuanced conversation. There's a lot that we can talk about when it comes to that. Uh, so it's not just one-sided. However, the danger is very real. The danger is very real. And people go through that very serious problems when they lose trust in religious people and especially the scholarly class. And this is one of the a, a serious problem that we're living with today. Anyhow, he points out here um, that what was what was what are their foundational mistakes? And um, he speaks about it, about the relentless support of falsehood, adornment of ignorance, an incitement against anyone who prefers to depart from the established practice of men, the marasim, and um, that the formalism of his time, where he saw this as a serious problem. And so his concept of in tariq al-akhirah, which is unique to him, he's the one that named it that way, and in a very depth way, a depth way, that he, he developed this concept precisely because what he that saw happening during his time with other scholars. And that, especially when it comes as an approach to knowledge, and they're that overly focusing on that things like fatwa, things like debate, and that trying to have a hollow, flowery language whereby which that they are trying to affect people and so forth and so on. So he, he attacks this. And that what has been neglected 
is that purification of the soul and rectification of the heart, which is the essence of this whole matter. And this was understood in the early t prophetic period, and the true people of religion have understood this in every period. Falling short regarding the culmination of this affair, preparation for death, meeting with Allah. What use is a lot of these mental gymnastics, if these mental acrobatics, if you know you're going to meet Allah? And that the, the worth of this dunya, ask someone who's on their deathbed what they think about dunya. And that shows you the worth of the dunya. What is all of that going to mean when we are on our deathbeds? What's it going to mean? And that a lot of the knowledge, in, that, that's in general, but even some of the knowledge that we study, what, why did we study that knowledge? How is it going to benefit us right, in that moment? As opposed to what's our heart attached to really? If you're attached to the awliya and the sadihin and the stories of the awliya and the sadihin, and if you're attached to that beneficial knowledge and love of Allah and love of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu and that's what you spend your life doing. And if you need to fulfill a fard kifayah, you're very clear that when you fulfill that communal obligation while you're doing it, then that's going to be a source of great solace for you that when you take your last breath. And so, this is where then he'll introduce the ilm tariq al-akhirah. And where that... Uh, as for the science of the path of the afterlife and how the righteous predecessors live the religion. And so he's doing something very important here, which we'll talk more about tomorrow morning. He is associating this unique conception of science of the path to the hereafter with the way of the salaf. And the way that he does that in his time is amazing. Because Imam al-Ghazali, of course, was a first-rate mutakallam, theologian. He was top-notch. And he was also a faqih. He was a jurist. And he'd also studied philosophy. And he'd also studied logic in depth. And that many of the other ulum, of the other sciences. And he takes from the various sciences. And he uses what he knows from these various types of knowledge to lay out a path for you and I to get close to Allah, which is essentially what he calls the ilm tariq al-akhirah. And the Ihya al-Mudin is his greatest book that he put all of that knowledge in. And so the Ihya al-Mudin, when we talk about it being 40 volumes, they're not just 40 volumes that, okay, here's one volume, there's another volume. No, one volume leads to another. They all build on each other. He himself said he that intentionally began with the book of knowledge because it is the bedrock of his whole project of Tejdi to make sure that you and I understand very clearly what knowledge is, what true knowledge is. And so the solution to the problem that he sees during his time, and again, he lived in particular historical circumstances, but it is just as applicable today. And those that have spent a little bit of time in academia will know this, and what happens in many academic circles, and the state of knowledge, the enterprise of knowledge, and the critique that we should have of the state of knowledge insofar as it exists in Western academic institutions today. And how can you and I, as believers, make sense of all of that and to know what knowledge that you and I need to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a good state. These are very deep topics that require that a, a lot of reading and a lot of discussion. However, that there's this book is rich and will prepare us to be able to navigate those conversations and to that come out in a way that it will we'll be able to benefit ourselves and others. The solution to revive the religious sciences to return to the way of the Salaf and to concentrate on beneficial knowledge. So now we're going to end our session. We have a few minutes. I want to just give an overview of what he does because in the Book of Knowledge, it's one of the longest books, if not the longest book, in the whole Ihya. 
And um, each chapter within the book of knowledge builds on the chapter before it as well. And so, as was mentioned, he says that I have prefaced the whole work with the book of knowledge due to its utter importance. And he mentions the three reasons that we previously said about that. And then a second key feature of the book on knowledge is his inclusion of knowledge of the heart as part of the fard'ayn, the individual obligations. He includes it as part of the individual obligations. It's an obligation to learn how to purify your heart. That a third feature, the subordination of kalam and fiqh to ilm tariq al-akhirah. This was part of why the ihya was controversial. And what that means is, is that not that kalam and fiqh are not important, but what it means is to think that only kalam and your understanding of kalam is important, or only fiqh and only your understanding of fiqh is important. No, obviously Imam Ghazali, and it, it might seem at first when you read the book on knowledge, is that he doesn't think fiqh or kalam is important. And if you read through the whole book, you'll realize that's not what he's saying. He's just attacking people's approach to kanam and fiqh, theology and jurisprudence. And he wouldn't have... Book two, which is the next retreat, inshallah ta'ala, is all about creed. It's all about creed. So he wouldn't have included that. And the thing is, is that uh, if the book was only for scholars, why would he include some of the basics? The scholars don't need the basics. Right. And the same thing goes with some of the basics of what he mentions of some of the other ahkam of fiqh in the various other books. Uh, so the, the book is, it is it's for a vast audience of anyone who can access it and, and to learn it. And, and so in a sense it also serves as like an encyclopedia and a reference that you can come back to. Uh, and you have to, of course, it's when, when we learn the basics that we start with more, the more basic books. But this is key. That... These books come in the Ihya, but because the work builds on it, what he, what he means by subordination here is, is that, that kalam and fiqh are a part of ilm tariq al-akhir, but in the end, after you learn what you need from kalam and fiqh, really the progression then is in the second half of the Ihya, which is all about the heart. So they're essential. They're building blocks. You can't do without them. But for people to think that that's the only type of knowledge and to neglect the type of knowledge that is really going to help them get close to Allah, that's what he's attacking. And then a redefinition, this is a fourth feature, of essential traits of scholars. Where he talks about Imam uh, Abu Hanifa, he talks about Imam al-Shafi, Imam Malik, Imam Ahmad, Imam Laytha ibn Sa'ad. And in addition to their outward scholarship, he talks about four key traits that they all had. Redefining. And then, that, um, uh, and we'll come back to that, inshallah ta'ala. Then, a reframing of essential religious terminology. And this is Ustad Amjad's session tomorrow morning, where he analyzes the words fiqh, ilm, tawheed, tadkir, and hikmah. And he talks about how the, um, that these words have been misused. And think about how ahead of his time he was. This is one of our key problems today with language in general, but especially religious terminology. People's understanding of certain words. He, uh, what was the, how were we translating that? What was the, the session? Uh, the restoration is better th actually than reframing. The restoration of religious terminology. And then another key feature, he places limitations on the scholarly community talking about potential dangers. Then he details the etiquettes of the student and the teacher. He talks about the etiquettes of the student, the etiquettes of the teacher. And then he gives 12 criterion whereby which we can determine is the scholar that we're learning from a worldly scholar of the dunya that are so dangerous or are they of the ulama al-akhirah, the other worldly scholars. No. And then he establishes a hierarchy of degrees of intellect, 
the highest being the ability to subdue one's desires and maintain a state of, dis of, of obedience. And maintain a state of obedience, which is the essence of traveling the path to the hereafter. So really, I'm just going over this very quickly. Each one of these, like think about every, it's so, Allah, how do you say it? Like, Yani, Imam al-Zadi, he presents it so seamlessly. It makes it seem so easy to understand. But there's so much that went into this. It's a masterpiece that is, 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 has come together so seamlessly and so beautifully. And all you really need to do is to read it. And you don't need to understand a lot of that, how all of that went into You're never going to fully, none of us are ever going to fully understand what was going through his mind so that he actually brought this and weaved it together in the way that he did in this book. We're never going to fully understand that. However, that it is very interesting to, to note how that his time and what he studied and his perspective led to the various choices that he made of the chapter titles and so forth and so on and the material that he includes. And so one author says, this notion of knowledge consequently, consequentially runs throughout the entire Ihya and constitutes the quintessential component for, re for renewal, Tajdeed. The notion of his, his notion of knowledge that he's presenting consequentially runs through the entire Ihya and constitutes the quintessential component for renewal. Another author says, in a deeper sense, the subject of knowledge is the key to the entire work. He invokes its centrality. It is the basis upon which a general spiritual quest must be founded. By prefacing his vast discourse with the treatment of the most fundamental topics, he also introduced what is a determining, if not always openly stated, object of the entire work. The revival embodies knowledge to be acted upon. So, inshallah ta'ala, we will suffice ourselves with that. Um, there's a lot that we, got, we, we talked about and a lot of food for thought. Um, if there's any questions about this, uh, we can uh, treat them tomorrow. Bidni uh, ta'ala. But I've already gone a little bit over time, so I don't want to take any more time. Inshallah ta'ala, we will pause. Do the rata bidni lai ta'ala, and then come back for class. Is that right? Let's, uh,